Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. And I hope that uh, while you were waiting, you dehydrated instead of hydrated. Because we got to get those parasites out of us, don't we? We have to take the hydra out, dehydrate ourselves. Of course, that's a bit of a joke. But um, many of you watch the channel Stale Cracker. And his tagline is, while we wait, we hydrate. While he's cooking up these meals, these blue-blooded meals with these hemocyanin unclean animals that he cooks. Now, I love his channel, and I think it's a positive message. But the Matrix is a strange place, isn't it? Where these things begin to manifest into our reality. We're going to talk a lot about that today. Things manifesting in our reality that we've talked about the week or two weeks prior. And how weird of a phenomenon that it is. And the fact that it's being guided by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to get into all that today. Make sure that we are connected up with you guys. And we're going to get into something that just happened to the Washington Monument. Now, here's what blew me away. I had all these revelations over last night and this morning. Yesterday, I wasn't quite sure what we were going to do today for the show. But when you have faith, God always provides, doesn't he? He provided some of these, probably some of the most startling revelations I think that we've disclosed on this channel before is what you're going to hear today. The Washington Monument. This is it right here. Everybody knows this iconic needle-like figure, this obelisk. But here's what was revealed to me. Washington Monument, for short, can be shortened to the word WAMON, or W-A-M-O-N, Washington Monument. And then at that point, all you need to do is flip the W around, and you get MAMON, or MAMON. Now... You probably never heard this before and you're probably asking yourself why is something so obvious only being revealed right now today in 2022 now we all know that the Washington Monument is 555 feet tall which equals 600 6,660 inches and so this is the reason why metal bands like Slipknot made a song called 555 is 666. Now, there's many other reasons why 555 is 666. 555 sounds like Vav, 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 which is 666, which is the monster drink. But here's a couple of other things that a lot of people really don't know because this is really not mainstream knowledge when decoding the Washington Monument. This obelisk aligns at exactly 88 degrees with the Capitol building in the background. In other words, go into Google Earth, you draw a line from this rotunda to the needle obelisk, and it measures 88 degrees. There's no doubt about that. Anyone can go do that and prove it. And the monument completed building in 1888. Now, here's the other thing a lot of people don't know. And these are, again, these are revelations that were revealed on this channel through the grace of the Holy Spirit. Was that this Washington Monument alignment forms a giant hypodermic needle. You can see the tip of it here. The tip is actually formed by the Washington Monument. It becomes the needle of the syringe. And we have plenty of uh, playlists on this subject. If you're interested in seeing how I outlined the syringe that runs through and points past the monument needle and terminates at the Lincoln Memorial. And in those videos and playlists, you'll hear me explain that the first hypodermic needles were invented under Lincoln because they were giving morphine to the soldiers. So all of this makes sense. And it all links back into 
The Planet of the Apes, in which Abraham Lincoln was featured looking like an ape. Why? Because the simian flu or virus was going around turning apes into humans and humans into apes. And that was the plot line of Planet of the Apes. So all of this goes back to these needles. Ape, Abe, Abe, Ape. The two words are almost the same. All you do is flip the B and do a P. Abe the Ape. So they know what's going on. They know exactly what's going on. They never thought that people could come together and figure it out. Now... Needless to say, this is a very occult place, isn't it? And why are we talking about the Washington Monument today? Let me make sure you guys are with me, and then we'll continue on with this. I'm going to show you something today that is literally going to make you sit down in your seat. You're going to be shocked. Here's what happened to the Washington Monument. Red paint was splashed on its side, and words were written, it was vandalized. And what it seems to say here, and I can't really make out all the letters because there are really no images online that show this whole thing. But what it seems to say here is, <clears throat> have you been by this? Government says tough. I think that probably says S-H-I-T at the end there, but I can't see because it's cut off. And when I think about the spiritual significance of what was written on the Washington Monument, it blows my mind that we had been so focused on this shape in the recent months, haven't we? Things literally manifesting out of nothing or out of things that we've covered. Now, what does this message mean? Well, it's hard to tell the intent behind this. Okay? There's a spirit at work, isn't there? Now, knowing what we know, if I were to try to interpret this, I would have to say something like that this would probably say, have you been... Basically, have you been here to receive this or something? Have you been by this? Have you been poked by this, maybe, is what it says. Have you been jabbed by this, is maybe what this says. And then this line down here, government says tough, S-H-I-T probably. So, in other words, have you gotten the needle? Now, the red paint is significant as well, because it represents sacrifice of pure innocent blood, doesn't it? Now, what I'm going to show you next is probably going to be one of the most profound things that many of you have seen in your walk with Christ. And I hope that this revelation that I just got from the Holy Spirit literally an hour and a half ago will bring many more people to Christ. So I'm going to show you definitive proof that the very first prophecy in the Bible is alive and well today. What was that prophecy? The serpent bruising the woman in the heel. Now I'm going to play this. I pre-recorded this. I did it in a program to overlay two images. So of course what you're looking at here, let me give you your orientation so you know what you're looking at. This down here is the Washington Monument obviously and then you have the Lincoln Memorial right here so now that you have your orientation everybody knows this let me go ahead and let this play out many of you already know what you're seeing here you already have spiritual eyes to see but for those of you that don't Let's take a look. Now, all I did was superimpose the bone structure of the heel and foot over the monument. And there you see 
Like, look at right here. You see these, all of the bones and ligaments appearing, designed right into the landscape. And you have the needle literally piercing the heel. Just like Genesis said it would. Look look at this. Look 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 at the shapes. Right here. Look at the heel. Look at the top of the foot and how it goes over here with these these bushes and things and trees or whatever those are. Look at the top of the foot here. Now as I was putting together this morning, you can even see the ankle up here and where the joint goes into the top of the foot here. Let's play it again one more time. Now I want you to focus on this area up here. And you see the ball of the, what do they call this, the tibia, fibia, I don't know what this is called. Going down into the foot of the ankle up here. To me, this is as clear as day. Now, all babies born in the United States get a heel prick test. They are bruised in the heel. And for many children, this bruising lasts for weeks in their heel. Jesus was pierced in the heel at the cross, wasn't he? And if you haven't already given your life to him, maybe this was the proof you needed to see that all of this that we cover on this channel and these revelations are very real and that they're not because of me i'm not special it's because of the body of christ all of you and the holy spirit revealing these things to people who care and love him giving your life to christ doesn't mean you'll be a perfect person it doesn't mean you won't continue to battle sin in your life and try to improve yourself as a person through his sanctification. What it means is that you start the journey with him. That you pray incessantly. And you talk to him continuously throughout your day. Consulting with him. Asking him for guidance. You go into a dark place. You talk within yourself to him. You don't even have to put your hands together and get on your knees like... The people in the paradigm of Christianity tell you to do. It's a personal walk. And through the inward, then you are outwardly changed as well. Because that is when other people see there's something different about you. That you have a kind and soft heart. And they want to know how that is. And that's what brings people to Christ. So, yes, and repent. Redeemed by all. Thank you. There are many tenets to the gospel. I always happen to leave one out. I don't do that intentionally, but that's why we're the body of Christ. We back each other up. So yes, repentance is part of it. Baptism is part of it. There's, there's all kinds of, well, there's not all kinds of things. It's not very difficult. It's actually very easy. It doesn't even mean that you have to walk into a church. And the biblical part about studying the Bible will come naturally. That will come naturally. All of us here today are studying the Bible, aren't we? We just talked about the prophecy in the Bible. We just related that to the enemy and his control over our world, didn't we? This is Bible study. Now, many of you will remember the Rolling Stones song. I see a red door and I want to paint it black with the lyrics in that song. Let's go back to this image here so we can get a visual of this. And that song played in the closing credits of the film The Devil's Advocate. That song came out in 1966. Devil's Advocate was filmed in the 66th floor penthouse of Trump Tower. I see a red door and I want to paint it black. What does that mean? Well, many of you that fish know that squid have blood that is copper-based. It's hemocyanin-based. It's supposed to be blue, but it looks black. And the same goes for the black goo 
meme that we see throughout films, really what they're depicting is blue blood. So what are the Rolling Stones really saying? You know, a stone was rolled in front of Jesus' tomb, wasn't it? But he still was not in the tomb when they came. What do these people want to do to us? They want to close the portal door to salvation. How do they do that? By painting the door with blue blood instead of red blood. Remember, the captive Israelites were under the blue blood Pharaoh, weren't they? And they had to paint their doors red with the blood of the Lamb to escape the wrath of God and to save their firstborn. And if you want to take a supernatural look at this paint splotch, this is where we get into the subjective, right? Obviously, there's different interpretations of this. But if you had to look at this as some kind of supernatural manifestation, it almost looks like the angel reaper coming for the firstborn. Doesn't it? Here's the sickle of the reaper in red and the blood being shed down here. Now, fortunately, the Pharaoh was the only one who lost his firstborn because the Israelites listened. Why did God have to take the firstborn of the Pharaoh? Well, because the Pharaoh was coming for his firstborn son, Jesus Christ. So therefore, that Passover, passing over the deaths of the Israelites, the angel or I can't, I always get this part wrong. Like, was it an angel or was it God that came and took the firstborn? I always forget that for some reason. I don't know why. But you guys can go to the Bible and read that. But that first, they called that a Passover, didn't they? And then Jesus would come later. And he was the firstborn of God. And he would hold a Passover. The Last Supper. So it's very, very, very possible that God supernaturally manifested this image onto the monument as a warning to the Pharaoh. We don't know, but crazy nonetheless. Now, they have since caught this guy, according to this article. Let's uh, take a look here. Doesn't say much. United States Park Police say Washington Monument is temporarily closed <clears throat> and a man is in custody for allegedly vandalizing the monument with paint on the evening of Tuesday, September 20th, 920, which is flipped around a two and a six, which is another 66. The man splashed red paint and wrote a profane message on the base of the Washington Monument. Park Police are unsure at this time if the temporary closure will affect the public visitation of the monument which would re normally reopen at 10 a.m. the following day. Repairs and cleaning of the paint will be handled by National Park Service. Iconic structure in the mall is named for George Washington, the country's first president, and was completed in 1888. Can't make this up, you guys. Let me check in with you. We're going to get into some other headlines today. So you guys are with me here. And... The rails are going to come off. Now, I don't sometimes know what I'm going to talk about the next day. But I, I go by faith. God tells me what to do, what to say, what to cover. And then we're on this journey, aren't we? So check this out. Speaking of blue bloods. A new blue tongue deer virus has been detected for the first time in deer now this is not good what is this about well thanks to the subscriber that sent this to me you guys we represent the deer to to them we are the deer all right and this whole blue tongue virus is basically a zombie virus i'm going to read this to you i had some images i was going to show you but it was too troubling even for me to show you what this does 
to these deer. Literally, it causes the eyes and mouth to bleed out and death ensues within three days. Sounds like a zombie, doesn't it? Wow. So, just know that this isn't a natural phenomenon. This is being orchestrated somehow, and it's coming to a theater near you, as they say. Let's read this. New York State Department of Environmental Conservation today reported three deer in Southampton, Suffolk County, tested positive for blue tongue virus, BT virus. This is the first time that the BT virus has been detected in New York deer. It was detected in several other mid-Atlantic states earlier this year. So this is a new disease in the mid-Atlantic. BT virus is closely related to episodic hemorrhagic disease virus. Both are transmitted in the same way. Once clinical signs of infection are apparent, deer usually die within 36 hours. Now, again, they're trying to say this is by biting midges. Didn't they say that uh, the zombie deer, we did another story like three, two or three weeks ago about a zombie deer found in a different state and they tried to blame it on biting midges as well. No CMs. But mysteriously in that report, they said that even though the deer can contract it through the biting midges, that, that it's humans don't get it that way. Now, everybody's been outside and you get bit by these noceums. So why does it affect deer and not people? Something's not right here, isn't it? For using our critical thinking. It says here, outbreaks are most common in late summer and early fall when midges are abundant. Diseases caused by BT and EHD viruses are usually not spread directly from deer to deer. And humans cannot be infected by deer or bites or from midges. There, you just heard it. So they found two white-tailed deer found dead in August, one in Shodak County or whatever, Renlesier County, another in South Southampton, Suffolk County, and that is what's going on. So here's the symptoms, fever, difficulty breathing, dehydration, swelling of the head, neck, and tongue, attraction to water. Wow, hmm, we're just talking about parasites attracted to water, right? Rapid death. Infected deer often seek out water sources and many succumb in or near the water source. So they basically drown themselves. Unbelievable. So they're saying the first case was ever confirmed was in 2007. <clears throat> Let's see what else is going on here. Lower Hudson Valley in 2011. And on and on and on. What do you do if you see a sick or dying deer? Probably report it. So you can see if their little uh, program is working according to plan. Probably. Who knows? Now, switching gears here. I guess Bo Jivin has declared the end of the spam dimmick. And since that's happened, now workers are going from hero to zero. Just like the nurses. Remember that? Oh, the brave employees working from home. Oh, they're so great. Oh, look at them. They're doing as they're told. They're getting stuck. Well, now they're really stuck. Because remember the employers were justifying keeping workers at home so they could keep their businesses alive during the spam pandemic. Well, now they want to force you back to work under the threat of losing your job. So all the sacrifices that you made don't really mean anything because if you don't go back to work, you're done. You're fired. Now, the work from home thing was a good thing for a lot of people because it helped parents recoup some of their family budget, right? Because a lot of people saved on child care, also commuting costs and the dangers of commuting. You guys, I lived in the Northeast for three years. And just getting in your car and going to work for five or six months out of the year is life-threatening. I don't care if you have a 10-minute commute or a 30-minute commute or an hour commute. I'm sure if they did studies on life expectancy of people commuting back and forth to work in the Northeast, you would see that you have a much higher rate of chance of dying 
just getting in your car and going to work and coming home from work than a lot of people do, than the general population. And you've got icy roads, you've got whiteout conditions, you've got heavy rains, you've got horrible roads, potholes everywhere in the Northeast. You got to dodge potholes and other people are dodging potholes, swerving around. I mean, it's crazy. I never knew anything like that existed. I grew up in California and pretty much uh, the worst thing we ever had to deal with out there was fog. And that was literally only maybe a few weeks, maybe a month out of the year and only during certain years. And when I was growing up, there was a lot of fog in California, but recently there hasn't been as much fog and I don't know what changed, but the fog used to be so thick, you would literally have to drive like 30 miles an hour on a 55 road, but you couldn't drive too slow because you, in fear of someone coming up behind you and rear ending you. So you get used to it after a while, the fog in the Central Valley of California. And I never had any accidents and most people I knew didn't. Usually it would come into play when, you know, you were under the influence of something. And that's when people would die in the fog. But um, that was the worst thing I ever had to deal with. Never knew what black ice was, really. Never knew what that was. And it rained so little in California that, uh, you know, it really wasn't a big deal. So, Northeast was a whole different program for me. There are days when a lot of the year, a lot of people don't even make it into work, which directly affects their bottom line. And causes them to lose income because a lot of people don't pay when you don't show up. And so it's really tough for working class people in the Northeast. Let me go in here and see if you guys, any of you guys live in the Northeast. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So this whole thing with working from home was a good thing. Saved on fuel costs, your safety, maybe lower insurance premiums because you have less fender benders. You guys, I've, pe I've seen people slide down driveways. Okay, you think in the Northeast that there would be, like, you wouldn't have steep hills and driveways because of the ice. But no, there are more hills and driveways in the Northeast than I think I've ever seen in my life. And so when the ice starts building up on the roads, people just simply slide down the hill. It's crazy. Now, it's to the point now where they don't even report it in the news anymore. They just pretend like it doesn't exist, but you can bet that the insurance premiums are through the roof in the northeast and then you've got <laughs> they use some kind of formulation in the road salt that rusts your car out within two or three years never seen anything like it and sometimes i think this stuff is some kind of racket you know like some kind of like mafia racket where they allow this stuff to happen and then people are making money off of it right like you got these powerful people like influencing people to allow them to use a certain kind of road salt or something because you look around and there are no vehicles that are unaffected by this rust over the short years i was there even my car started developing rust underneath i'd have that car for six or seven years before that you go out there and all it takes is a couple winter seasons and your car rusts from the bottom out from the inside out stuff starts breaking I had to replace my muffler. So, why is life so difficult when we're supposed to have all this technology and stuff? Like working from home. It's because they do it on purpose. People at the top make a ton of money. So, there's Snowball. Snowball and I were supposed to meet up. I never made it to meet him up. I just, I'm so busy, you guys. Apologies for that. He reached out several times and wanted me to cover uh, Rosemary's Baby. He had some revelations on that, so I'll give him a shout-out. Good to see you, Snowball. Um, so you know what I'm talking about. He lives up there. He didn't live too far from where I was at. Crazy times, you guys. So anyway, let's keep going with this. So what are they? So what's going on with these, with these, uh, these employers now? So now that these employers have used the American workers... And the corporate America has been strengthened beyond imagination. And small businesses have been basically crushed, especially those who could not adapt to the new economy. Now they want to shove you right back into the rat race so they can recoup some of their losses, right? 
even though they got a bunch of money uh, allowing you to make it force you know making you stay at home let's read a little bit of this in the constant tug of war the office return it seems the bosses are back with the upper hand oh good for you that's really going to go over well forcing people back to work more workers were in the office last week than they have been since the spam demic started per castle systems get back in your castle a data property management security firm that tracks key card entries oh you mean the key you mean the apollo key card entry system i think it's called somebody correct me on that but uh these t these time or is it called helios these time card systems are basically named after the false god let's keep reading here while office attendance isn't where it was before the spam demic it's getting there 47 percent of all workers who were in the office in 2020 before the shutdown were in the office from september 8th to september 14th that's a record high over the past couple of years white collar workers settled into their home offices but after this past Labor Day weekend, many employers drew a line in the sand and ushered their employers back to work. Get back to work. With the corona with the coronavirus seemingly here to stay and the severity of the next variant unknown, companies like Apple, Comcast, Peloton have mandated that workers return to the office on a hybrid basis and yet another push for a sense of workplace normalcy. You guys, there's nothing normal about forcing a person into a building for 40 to 60 hours a week spending three quarters of their time away from the people that they really love to make somebody else rich that you don't even know or care about there's nothing normal about that at all so it's not the original design of the human family we're meant to be spending most of our time with our spouse and our children working together you know growing stuff or i don't know building stuff i don't know there's nothing normal about this this paradigm that we've that we've all just accepted so this is what's going on now let's get into this next story here this is kind of creepy remember the shining twins another topic we've been covering at length haven't we well <clears throat> nothing to see here right uh, it's just in the center of the world stage uh, at the Queen's funeral now, we'll get into that in a minute, but who were the Shining Twins? Well, these were the basically the first murders in the Overlook Hotel. The first caretaker that got possessed by the hotel. And so, in essence, this, these two girls are the twin spirits in the host body. The twin spirits in the haunted hotel. Well, guess what? Here they are today. These are the twins from The Shining, and here they are at the Queen's funeral. And for some reason, everybody thought it would be really cool to take a picture of them and do a full story on them. Uh, you think they're trying to tell us something about twin spirits in a host body? About possession? I think they probably are. I think they probably are. So, they had this full story done on them at the Queen's funeral. Amidst all the other people they could have interviewed, they're going to interview these two people. Now, is the house of Windsor possessed? I believe it is. I believe this whole Dracula angle and all this is telling us something as well. What do they have to say about it? Let's see if there's any coded language in this article here. I like to read through these sometimes. But these are just mostly pictures. Showing the celebrities, checkerboard floors... Danny from The Shining. The girly shared their experience on their joint Shining Grady Twins Twitter account. Oh, brother. He's got the red hat on. And, jeez. Now, of course, they were just children of this movie film. These people are victims. And, uh, you know, of all of this. It's borderline abuse. Eating cake. Let them eat cake, right? castles and all this stuff crazy so this is just some stuff look at this crazy cat weird okay <clears throat> now let's keep going here i got a few more stories for you when you guys mentioned to me that bo jivin just passed an executive order about biotech and biomanufacturing and of course like always 
to me, it just feels like they intentionally convolute the language in these in these bills. And why would they do that? Well, it's so that normal people of normal intelligence won't understand what the heck they're talking about. And this is how they pass stuff, don't they? So, here's the actual bill. And as you can see, it's just a big word sandwich. Let's see, where is it? Where'd it go? Oh, jeez. Lost it. Uh, okay. Anyway, I had it pulled up before. Needless to say, it's a big word sandwich. So I decided to get a little help from my friends, right? So I looked up how people were feeling about this bill. And lo and behold, cattlemen raise concerns about the executive order on biotechnology. Now let's read about this because this is very important. This is more on the war on meat, right? And all I have to say about this is anytime something like this is pushed from the top down, then you have to ask yourself why. It's bipartisan. Well, I don't know if it's bipartisan, but you have to ask yourself why. And one particular scripture in the Bible comes to mind. First Timothy talking about those who forsake. It's a doctrine of demons who forsake eating of meat. It, they call it a doctrine of demons. Not to say you can't abstain from meat. But when you turn it into a doctrine and try to tell everyone else not to do it too, and say that, try to prove that the Bible says you're not supposed to, it becomes a doctrine of demons. So hopefully all the vegetarians don't jump on me, but because I'm not saying it's bad to be a vegetarian, I'm saying when you try to force it on other people. Now let's read what the cattle industry says about this. White House announced an executive order on advancing biotechnology and biomanufacturing. Innovation for Sustainable, Safe, and Secure Bioeconomy. Now, of course, they're going to do their little studies. See how much, how many times a cow farts. They're going to work that into their, their little formula and decide that it's unsustainable. Right? That's what's probably going to happen next. Let's keep reading here. It outlines a whole of government approach to advance biotechnology, biomanufacturing towards innovative solutions in health, climate change, energy, food security, agriculture, supply chain resilience, and national and economic security. On its face, the executive order promotes a science and risk-based system to support the development and the use of products of biotechnology. U.S. cattle producers are regular consumers of products developed using biotechnology, from livestock feed derived from genetically modified ingredients to, oh look, they throw that in there, to medically important smack the nations administered to livestock to treat and prevent disease. Now, look, notice how they flip this around. Let's keep reading here. However, the executive order directs the Secretary of Agriculture uh, to submit a report assessing how to use biotechnology and biomanufacturing for food and agriculture innovation, including cultivating alternative food sources. And there is... The million dollar phrase. Alternative food sources. The war on meat. At a press conference held in anticipation of the release of the executive order, senior administrative official further specified that we're also looking to improve food security, drive agricultural innovation. The U.S. Cattlemen's Association issued the following statement. Now before I read this statement, if you think this is all just a big nothing sandwich, understand that the, the younger generation of children, preteens, teens, almost unanimously believe that it is horrific to kill an animal and eat it. This is how they've been programmed. It's happening already. They've already programmed the youth, entire generation of people that don't think it's right to eat an animal. Let's keep reading here. Cultivation of animal cells for human... Oh, this is what the Cattlemen's Association said. Here's their statement. The cultivation of animal cells for human consumption does not further the goals of the Biden administration supporting independent agricultural producers. Instead, it promotes corporate and consolidated control of the food supply system. Cell culture products cannot be independently produced. The, uh, the technology is shrouded in intellectual property protection and requires intensive capital resources. These factors could lead to the monopolistic control of America's sovereign food supply. 
our God-given right to eat food. You guys, this goes all the way back to Abel and the sacrifice of the lamb and the right to eat meat. Goes all the way back to it. So, here's what's going on. Cattle industry is upset about this. The NCBA does not support President Biden's biotech executive order either. National Cattlemen's Beef Association is questioning the recent executive order from the White House regarding advanced biotechnology. Extremely disappointed in the executive order. Also addresses fake meat production under the guise of food security. Supporting cell cultured fake meat production is the wrong approach and the administration should remain focused on supporting America's farmers and ranchers. Now, do you think this is all going to change if Trump's elected? Of course it's not. Of course it's not. This is probably a bipartisan agenda. Now, we need to hold people accountable. So if Trump gets elected or whoever else, uh, DeSantis, whoever gets elected, we need to remember this and make them reverse it. And if they don't, then you'll see their true colors emerge. Let me check in with you guys. Well, I got a couple more stories for you. I didn't want this to be a super long show today, but I appreciate everybody that showed up. If you're late to the show, you definitely want to rewind this afterwards and look at the first 20 minutes because that was probably some of the most powerful stuff you've seen on this channel disclosed that we found at the Washington Monument. So, let's continue on here. Unbelievable. Now, I didn't really figure this out until I started digging, but the indigenous people under the English monarchy are starting to speak out. And remember the Commonwealth Games decode that we did? Remember that? And remember I brought up the whole thing about colonialism during the opening ceremony? As each country in the Commonwealth was marching out their representatives and I was telling you how this was all just a show to make it look like the people of the colonies were happy even though they really weren't. Remember that? We discussed the hypocrisy of the reign of terror of the British rule waged on these colonies and the history behind it. Well, here we are again, full circle. And wait till you see this. The Queen died exactly one calendar month after the Commonwealth Games closing ceremony. August 8th, she died September 8th, one calendar month. And then I looked up the dates between the opening of the ceremony, which was on uh, July 28th, through to her death. And that was exactly 42 days. That's the God number, of course. So the God number and then of the opening and the death of her almost matching the, the Commonwealth Games. So it's interesting now that the uh, indigenous folks are talking about this. Let's read this. As millions bid their final farewells to Britain's Queen Elizabeth on Monday, First Nations communities in New Zealand and Australia are speaking out on their ties with the monarchy. Indigenous Australian Parliament member Lydia Thorpe took her oath of office last month with a gesture that made headlines around the world. I, Sovereign Lydia Thorpe, do solemnly sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the colonizing uh, to the colonizing Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Oh, wow. Last week, Thorpe spoke up about the pain, suffering, and marginalization they endured under the thousand-year-old monarchy. So many of my people have been murdered by the system and the colonial regime here. I felt that I was kneeling to the murderer. Wow, strong words. These people are speaking out. They are angry, and rightfully so. This is oppression. This is this goes more this goes all the way back to the imprisonment of God's people. And I'm not saying all these people are God's people. I'm saying this is all spiritually symbolic under the rule of the Pharaoh, right? That's what this is all about. It's about one group of people basically oppressing another. So, this goes on. I'm not going to read through this whole thing, but needless to say, their voices are now starting to be heard. What will come of it? Probably nothing, but at least they're speaking out. Now, 
switching gears once again. If you're on the fence about driving an electric car, the 66s are everywhere. Look at this. I drove a Tesla Model Y and discovered six reasons not to buy his 666. Are you kidding me? Six reasons, $66,000 electric SUV. Uh, okay. So now you see. You're on the fence about how these people write these articles, what they're really about and who they serve. Hopefully today's show will be a testament that this stuff is all very real. Six reasons, $66,000. And who can even afford a $66,000 sedan anyway? Okay. That only seats four people. This is definitely a status symbol, isn't it? This excludes 95% of people. So why is this continually being pushed in the media? How is this even a profitable business? If you're going to spend $66,000, who's going to do that? You're going to buy something different. I wouldn't buy this car. So, weird times, you guys. Now, I'm going to close today's show or begin to wind down the show with a little discussion on the Netflix series called The Devil in Ohio. I watched the entire series yesterday. There were eight episodes. And there's some really evil stuff going on in Ohio in real life authorities just found a three-year-old boy locked inside a cage filled with bugs in Ohio what the heck is going on I'm going to read a little bit of this story grandmother was arrested and parents were wanted after toddlers were discovered in a home found in deplorable condition they went to the home on Sunday September 8th they were investigating sexual assault, and a three-year-old child was discovered locked in a cage that had been secured by zip ties. Sheriff's office said it was filled with bugs, soiled bedding, and cup full of spoiled milk. Unbelievable. He was holding a meth pipe. This breaks my heart. Now, let's hop off of that and talk about what's really going on in this series the devil in Ohio now every once in a while when I'm doing a decode the Holy Spirit says to me it's too much for people to handle so I'll usually because I have the full armor on and this is what I do in service to the Most High I'll continue to watch these series but I typically won't capture the screen captures and present it to you because they can carry dark energy but I am going to report back to you what this series was about now the vibe was of course very dark contained intense spiritual activity and interestingly this series which is really weird they resurrected a lot of these characters from Battlestar Galactica here's one of the guys he, he plays the cult leader Many of you will recognize him from Battlestar Galactica, the reboot that came out, I think, in the early 2000s. If you haven't watched Battlestar Galactica, the reboot, that is a good series to watch. Even if you're not into sci-fi, because basically it's a retelling of the Bible. Biblical themes with a twist, obviously. They're not going to tell us the truth about the Bible. But basically the crew of Battlestar Galactica are in this ship. It's the last ship. It's an antiquated ship. And the entire universe of humans is destroyed by Cylons, which is basically the artificial intelligence that the humans created. Cylons become self-aware. They then turn on their captors and basically kill everyone except the people on the Battlestar Galactica ship. The Battlestar Galactica ship then is racing across the universe to try to find Earth, which they read about in a prophecy. And... They believe Earth is their sanctuary. Now, what biblical story could this be representing? Huh. Well, I'm going to go back in the chat, and you guys can tell me what biblical story you think that's representing. Here's one of the other characters in The Devil in Ohio, who was also in Battlestar Galactica. He plays the attorney in Battlestar... I'm sorry, in Devil in Ohio, and he plays basically the... 
lead guy under the captain in Battlestar Galactica. Okay. Now, I'm also going to be decoding another series that has Battlestar Galactica characters in it as well that just came out. It's called The Imperfects. So I'll be decoding The Imperfects probably today or tomorrow. So what, what's happening here? These themes of Battlestar Galactica being reconstituted. Let's go back in the chat and see what you guys, what biblical story you guys think Battlestar Galactica was all about. Let's let this catch up. Zoom you guys up in here. All right. Let's see who gets it first. Play the uh, Jeopardy music. <laughs> All right. Let's see who gets it first. What story is that about? Yes, the 12 tribes. Just saw that pop up. Absolutely. So the Cylons become like the pharaohs. Chasing the Israelites through the Red Sea. The Israelites go to the Promised Land, don't they? And that's exactly what the Battlestar Galactica crew was looking for, was the Promised Land. And in the very last episode of that entire series, I think it went like eight seasons or something, they find Earth, and it's like this heavenly type of place. It's all pristine. But the story they tell in the series is that that's how man started, that we came from outer space. So there's the twist. There's the lie, and they always have to tell the lie, don't they? So there's nothing new under the sun. Biblical stories repeating over and over again in our reality. So let's get back to the devil in Ohio, because I'll tell you what that's about as we close the show out here. The devil in Ohio is about this girl right here, and she escapes a satanic cult. And she's rescued by this lady who's a social worker. Now, this lady, this, who's the social worker, has her own dark past of abuse from her father. Not a cult, but an abusive uh, you know, childhood. And so, when this new girl comes into her family, it causes all these problems with her family. And it ends up pulling the entire family into the clutches of this cult. Now, what troubled me about this series was that this girl right here uses witchcraft throughout the series and I don't want to show you guys that stuff because look a lot of kids are into this stuff now you guys you need to look around and wake up to this stuff they're into this look at this inverted cross now of course there's all these cliches going on in Devon Ohio that there are symbols an inverted cross and here you see it in the wheat field but basically this whole witchcraft thing is becoming very popular in young younger children and, and where do they learn it? They see it on stuff like this. And this stuff is very dark. This can draw you into some very dark situations. You can become demonically uh, oppressed, um, possessed even, dabbling in this stuff. So I do not want to show that stuff on this channel. So here's the crazy thing. This girl here uses this witch witchcraft to trick the family into having empathy for her. And by the end of the series, it's this girl who emerges as the true cult leader. She manipulated even the cult leader. She even manipulates her own true mother into becoming the sacrifice in her place. So, what else was apparent in this TV series? Well, they mention the morning star. And they mention it often because that's who these people worship. They also talk about a thousand year reign of the devil, which of course is backwards because it's Jesus who's going to reign for a thousand years before the devil is unleashed one last time to make one final attack on the new earth and the new heavens, and then it'll be wiped out forever. But during the thousand years, the scrolls will be opened. Everybody will be talking about everything that just happened and gaining understanding of why evil needs to be eradicated from the universe now why would god allow evil to be resurrected one last time well it's to prove possibly i don't know what's in god's head but i would think to prove that look even after we gave these people a chance and allowed them to be resurrected they still want to kill us and that will be the justification by which god eradicates all evil thoughts 
all sin in the universe and everything else. We'll be living in bliss. And that's what I want. I don't want to have to battle sin anymore. I want to just have that channel turned off in my brain. And that's what God's going to do for us. But a lot of people believe that they should have a choice, don't they? They want to have a choice to do evil. And that's what the entire Bible is all about. This is why there's suffering in the world. God's allowing it to happen. To prove that, look, when you give the devil a choice, here's what he's going to do. He's going to make you suffer. And there's always going to be a victim. Even if you think your sin isn't affecting other people, it always is. And therefore, God will have to eradicate it. So, here's the problem with this series as well, is that they try to blur the lines as to who the morning star is. Now, why is that confusing? Well, Jesus is called the morning star, and Lucifer is called the morning star in the Bible. And the thing is, is a lot of people are confused about that. In fact, yesterday's show, I think we mentioned this, and people were confused in the comments. They're like, this is weird. Why is Jesus and Lucifer the morning star? And they automatically think that Jesus and Lucifer are the same thing. And this is one of the things that kind of turned me off to uh, Gematria. Because when you look at the values, the numerical values of some of these words, like Jesus and Lucifer, sometimes they look like they equate each other. And it can confuse people. Now, I've since talked to a couple of Gematria channels and kind of softened my stance on, you know, basically condemning Gematria. But I just, I have my reservations about it. Just, just put it that way. Uh, I'm not trying to start any trouble. I'm just saying that some people that can use Gematria to actually make God look bad or make God seem like he's the devil too because the values equal each other. And, that, and all that does is confuse people confuses the body of Christ. Now let me explain to you what this morning star thing is all about because the book of Job clarifies this for us. God, in God's own words, he tells us the truth about the morning stars. This is Job 38. Job is talking to God and God is explaining to Job that he was the one who is basically the most high and telling him where were you when all of this was created let's see let me find the verse here where is it da, da, let's see where'd it go we'll just search the page let's do that blind today there it is <clears throat> so Job helps us decode the secret of the morning star Whereupon, okay, who hath laid the measures thereof? This is God talking. If you know, or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations therefore fastened? He's asking Job, do you know where the foundations of the world are? Do you know where the measures are? Or who laid the cornerstone? He's talking about the creation of the earth. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. What God is explaining to Job here is that there were multiple morning stars. And there was once unity in heaven at the creation of the world. Right? This is what he's saying here. This was before Lucifer fell. So Lucifer is still a morning star. But he got kicked out of the club. And this is why both Lucifer and Jesus are called morning stars in the Bible. Now, if you if I wouldn't have shown you this, then you would be very confused, wouldn't you? And especially if you watch the show. You'd be like, what the heck? Morning star, you go look it up in the Bible and you're like, oh shoot. Jesus and Lucifer are the same thing. That's what you would think, right? Unless you read Job. Unless you read Job. Job. And so this movie or this TV series, The Devil in Ohio, banks on the fact that you're only going to dig surface deep, that you're not going to watch a channel like this 
you're going to get deceived and you're going to think that the Bible has contradictions in it. You're going to start to doubt your entire faith. And so this is one of the bad things about the series as well. So that was about it for today's show. I know this was a long show today. I'm all talked out. I can only usually talk for about an hour and I get, can't talk anymore. But um, yeah, so look, there's... Uh, there's a few folks in the chat who do gematria, and like I said, I've softened my stance over that. We've had a, I've had a discussion with Joseph. Thanks, Joseph, for clarifying a lot of things. Uh, we need to maybe do a better job in our community of countering some of these disinformation agents out there that are using gematria in a bad way and call them out. I don't know how to do that, but um, they're the ones causing the problems, not channels like Joseph. Joseph is obviously a believer, but there are unbelievers who try to use Gematria to make the body of Christ confused and make us look bad, right? <clears throat> so, thanks Joseph for reaching out and being kind with humility, and we both kind of got to the bottom of everything, I think, or at least started down a path of getting to the bottom of everything. So, uh, Joy asks, what about Krizlon? Well, we talked a little bit about that the other day. Um, about uh, Trump and his uh, interview with uh, the father of Angelina Jolie, John Voight. Now, many of you noticed there was an Apollo statue. I completely missed that. There's an Apollo statue in the mirror image of Trump in that interview. Let's look it up. Wait, can we look it up? Let's see here. Uh, Trump, uh, John Voight. Let's see if there's any screen... Uh, oh, let's see. Here it is. Pull this up here. Okay. So, is this it? Let's see here. Let's find this. Let's see if we can find the, uh, oh, here it is. Oh, there it is right there. Wow. So, Apollo confirmed, right? Let's see here. Let's find that image here. That was Apollo in the background. There it is right there. So there's Apollo, the man in the mirror. He's pointed away from Trump. This is Janus all the way through. Janus was the two-faced god. Apollo, unbelievable. Let's see if there's any, a one that's more in focus here. Okay. Whoops. There it is. Wow. Look at that. Now, I don't know who confirmed that this is Apollo. This is a statue, but a lot of people are talking about it, so it probably is. But yeah, this is the man in the mirror. Look at There's the picture of him draping the flag, and he's staring right into Apollo. In case you had any questions about me making comparisons to Apollo. Right there in our faces, you guys. Unbelievable. All right, let's go back into the chat. Wow. What a show today, right? Lots of revelations. Whew. Okay. Marcy says the flag. Yeah, worship the flag, not not the most high. That's what they're doing. Yes, Apollo is Apollyon, Boomer Bear. And that's who he is. The, the destroyer. So, oh, so someone asked about Krizlam. So, the reason why I brought that up and it jogged my memory was because the whole thing about that interview was vote for Trump to save Israel. That's what the whole interview was about. He's saying, if you don't vote for me, the, the this alliance between Israel and Islam is going to fall apart because Trump made some huge economic deal where he put together, he basically had Israel working with all these Islamic countries and making billions and billions of dollars through trade. And so, basically, um, he also talked about Abraham and 
Abraham's sons, one of which was what they tell us is Israel and one was Islamic. Esau and Jacob. Wait, no, not Esau, Jacob. This is where I'm weak in my Bible studies. I need to research more about Abraham's sons. But one was um, you know, Islamic and one was supposedly from the Israelite. So I don't know what's what. Everything's gotten spun around. I don't know who the true Israel is anymore or the true is Islam and all that. Or if it was even linked to the two. But I can tell you this. Someone said to me the other day that... If we looked at the story of Abraham and his sons. Well, let me back up. Let me do a complete show on that because I don't want to mess this up. Thanks. It's Ishmael. Thanks, Terry. Ishmael was told that his life was going to be hard, that he was going to be a tough child, wasn't he? And someone said, oh, Ishmael came from the Lord. No, it does, the Bible doesn't say Ishmael came from the Lord. It says that Ishmael... That she was pregnant with Ishmael. And that Abraham's uh, mistress or whatever, she was Egyptian. She was of the blue bloodline. So the bloodline was already established, wasn't it? The angel did tell her that, that if she had this child, that she would be blessed in abundance of lots more children. It does say that. But it does not say that that child came from the Lord. Because a lot of people, or this particular person, tried to make the connection that just like Eve got a man from the Lord and it was Cain that that uh, the mistress of Abraham also got a man from the Lord. And that they're two completely different interpretations of those scriptures. So, yes, Israel was from the mistress and she was Egyptian of the blue bloodline. Now, why would God allow this to happen? Why would the angel bless this child with abundance. Well, because God has a plan, doesn't he? He is always tried to make, I don't want to say concessions, but include the blue bloodline. He protected Cain even for seven generations, didn't he? Even though he put a mark on him, he always tried to reach across the aisle, so to speak, and give them a chance. But every time they seemed to prove him wrong. They would come after the Israelites. They would try to wipe them out. They would fight. It was that age-old prophecy from the book of Genesis. Prophecy of the two seed lines, wasn't it? Playing out throughout history. And, yes, it was Hagar. Hagar was the mother of Ishmael. Thank you for helping me jog my memory. And so there you have it. The truth about that as well. And in the interview with Trump, they told this they tried to retell the biblical story and make it sound like that both of these men were from God and that we're all supposed to get along. Now we are supposed to get along, but what he's doing over there is something different. It's a lie. It's a lie. So glad we got to cover that as well. He was trying to re he was trying to unite the two religions together. That's what he was trying to do in that interview. Chrislam, right? So, Hagar couldn't drive 55. <laughs> right? Life in the shack? Love your guys' jokes. All right. Now, Jesus made the final, bridged the final gap between the two bloodlines. He offered salvation to Jews and Gentiles. He mostly talked to the Jews, but he included the Gentiles in his ministry. And to this day, I will not sit here and try to name who the Jews and Gentiles are. I just, it's too confusing. And I'm talking in terms of race. You would be making a mistake if you tried to identify a specific race as a Jew or a Gentile or things like that. Because everything's gotten so mixed up and turned around. The thing you should be focused on is that Jesus came to save both sides if you believe in him. Okay, so there's a choice still after all this time. For all this time that the the uh, Pharisees and the Pharaohs and the, the Canaanites tried to wipe out God's people. After all this time, he still sent his son 
to offer them and everyone in humanity a chance. Someone uh, asked me about RH negative the other day. And again, I'm not going to sit here and try to identify a race or blood type of people that is of a certain bloodline. Because it's just right there you're already losing. Because Jesus came for both and all. And really on our level, everybody here in the the level of people who don't have any power to change anything really. We're down here on the level of where the receivers of control rather than the controllers. We are all the same anyway. It's the people in power who have consolidated bloodlines and ruled over the rest of us. They're the ones who we focus on talking about. So, that's about it, you guys. I love each and every one of you. We'll be back on here tomorrow. I have a few more headlines for tomorrow, but I didn't want to overwhelm you guys today with too much information. I love each and every one of you, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Take care and be safe, you guys.